get started. Um, I'm assuming Emma's going to join. I have not heard otherwise. Um, opening the um, November 18th, 2020, uh, Montpelier Roxbury Board of School Directors um, meeting at 6.34. Uh, let's just do roll. Um, Anika? Aye. Here. Uh, Ryan? Aye. I think, I think you can say here. here. Um, since we're not voting, but I, I think does it. Jill? Here. Jerry? Here. Mia, yeah, this is your first one. Present. Andrew? Here. And Mara? Here. Um, so before I go to public comment, I just want to announce that unfortunately Mara has decided to step down. Um, to attend to some personal matters. So we're all very, very sad about that. She's been an excellent board member uh, and has really helped us uh, guide through some, some complex issues, particularly around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we certainly hope that we can draw on your resources in the future, Mara, and your expertise in that area, um, mm -hmm. but definitely understand your decision. Um, but that also means that we will, again, be seeking um, another board member. Um, so I know we had a robust pool um, last time, so it'd be great if those who were interested previously um, would be continued to be interested because we had three fantastic candidates, but also anyone else. Um, and we'll be sending out something more formally, but uh, probably in the next two to three board meetings will um, hopefully be making a re, uh, an appointment to that position. But thanks again to, to Mara and for all the, uh, the great service she's, she's given the board um, over the last uh, several months. Um, so Jim, Jim, what does that mean for the SRO committee? Uh, we're probably gonna have to appoint another board member to the SRO committee. Um, okay. And we can, we can do that tonight or um, we can wait a little, you know, give it a little time and see if anyone else wants to, to step up. But um, I suggest we do that tonight because that committee is, is moving quickly. Um, so maybe we can add that to the agenda. Um, that would seem to go with um, the appointment of the vice chair. Um, and then also, uh, Mia has expressed interest in uh, serving on the superintendent evaluation committee. Um, although maybe with that in mind, she might want to do SRO in, in the interim. So I think that's going to be, um, if she's interested, um, that is going to be a time commitment as, as well. Um, but we can get to that later and maybe give Mia some, some time to think about it since this is new information. Uh, um, all right, uh, with those two announcements, let's move to public comment. Um, if anybody has public comment, uh, please uh, raise your hand using the raise hand function, uh, which is in, if you hit on, if you hit the participants link at the bottom of your screen, it'll, a little uh, pop up will come up and, and there's a raise hand button at the bottom of that pop up. Um, if if uh, you have any difficulty figuring that out, feel free to just um, make yourself visible and, and physically raise your hand. Okay, seeing, seeing none, um, we can move to the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? And I think Mia noticed some typos, so we might want to pull those out and correct them. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Do we need, Ryan, do we need to do anything special if we're going to be correcting typos in terms of that motion? Yeah, and I think we have warrants to add into the game across today or yesterday also, right? So yeah, there's a warrant that came across and a couple more appointments. 
Um, yeah, so just so that the motion is clear, we should make the additions and the whatever we're pulling out for discussion. <coughs> so I guess see Mara, your last meeting. Do you want them the honors? I I move that we <laughs> accept the consent agenda. <coughs> With uh, with corrections as noted. Yeah, and additions as noted. Yes. Uh, Second. Uh, all those. Well, I guess we have to do the roll call again. Etiquette. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Jill. Aye. Jerry. Aye. Mia. Aye. Andrew. Aye. Mara. Aye. Great. Consent agenda passes. Um, move to the board discussion and uh, uh, Brian Murphy, I think, yeah, I see you, is here to talk about the naming of the baseball field. So, um, Brian? Um, yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Murphy. Um, I'm also here with my son, Aiden Murphy. Um, and also, you'll see Oliver Plavin is on screen, as well as uh, Nicholas Bevan. They're also uh, teammates of Peyton Smith. Um, you know, I sent an email earlier about this, and I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to, you know, put us on the agenda and listen to us tonight. Uh, the idea that we have, um, well, just reminding everybody, unfortunately, sadly, Peyton Smith, who was a student at Montpelier High School and graduated from the school last spring, passed away from bone cancer um, in October. And it was a long time that he spent battling bone cancer. And during that time, he was going back and forth to Boston a lot for those treatments. There were difficult treatments that he was going through. But one of the respites they had from that difficult journey was playing baseball. And some of the best memories were being able to be out on the baseball field with the guys, uh, be able to make friends and just have fun and kind of forget about what he was going through um, and enjoy just being a teenager and having fun with his friends. So our thought and you know, this thought that Aiden came up with and some others just talking about it is that since there's no name for the baseball field at Montpelier High School, and just to be clear, we're talking about the baseball field at the high school not the Mountaineers field over at the recreation center or anything like that, just the one that's um, you know right behind the school, to have that field named after Peyton, to call it Peyton Smith Field. Um, the idea is that we would go ahead and have a plaque, you know, we'd raise some money, get a plaque to put together, attach it to the um, backstop there, maybe have a little um, celebration at home opener uh, in, this, in May or so, and the first game, uh, and just kind of a way, they can always be remembered there uh, for his family and his friends and everything. So that's the idea. And, you know, I don't want this all to become from me. It's really come from the students. So I want to invite Aiden, Nicholas, and Oliver just to speak about, you know, their thoughts of um, Peyton and what this might mean. When Peyton first moved here, he, his family had just come from the Netherlands being a military family. And they had just found out that he had, bone cancer and he showed up a few days late to school and the one thing that really made him excited was hanging out with the baseball team and getting to be out on that field back there and I think that having the, that the fact that there's no name for the field right now and we have the chance to name it um, it'd be great to be in Peyton's name. Oliver, Nicholas? Yeah um, so I'm Nicholas. I was also a captain on the baseball team with Aiden, and I was lucky enough to get to know Peyton pretty well, whether it was just on the baseball team or in school and classes. I had almost all my classes with him, and he really inspired me as a person more than anyone I know, and I'm sure you could ask anyone who was on the team with us or just anybody around school. They'd say the exact same thing, but he really just he he did more than inspire me to be a better person. He really just changed my life. And as soon as I heard this idea of naming the field after him, I thought that was amazing. And I thought that'd be a great way to honor him. 
Hi. Um, so like me, Payton did not grow up in Montpelier, but he fit in and he was part of this community from basically day one. Um, I think he belonged everywhere. And this is clear from his dedication to the team, um, his perseverance um, through, you know, battling cancer. Um, and by the ease of him being able to make friends was really inspiring. And I think uh, naming the field after Payton would be um, a great way uh, to commemorate his life and what he stood for. So I'm not sure what the process is and how the vote would go and everything, but um, that's our request is if we could go ahead and um, have that occur. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brian, Aiden, Oliver, and, and Nicholas. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea and a, a great way to, to pay tribute to, to Peyton and, and uh, you know, his, his sadly uh, cut short life and the contribution he made to the community and to all the people he touched. So uh, I'm certainly supportive. Libby, I, I think we just need a, a motion. Um, Jim, can I make a suggestion to the board? Yeah to either discuss and yay or nay. We have, a, we have a very healthy fund balance and there's no reason to raise money for this. We can make a beautiful That's... sign for Peyton um, out of that money and we can get the guys to, to help us design that. Um, That'd be awesome. So it matches what Peyton would want. So I would, I would recommend to the board that we use our fund balance to, to get a pretty killer sign going on our baseball field. Need some touch-ups anyway. Yeah, that, that was my next question was whether um, this was something we could, you know, we could, we could fund without. So, uh, so I would love to entertain a motion to both, uh, name, name the field, uh, after Peyton Smith and, uh, to, uh, uh set aside some funds to, you know, put a, a plaque up or another, um, you know, put a plaque and, and other commemorations to acknowledge the naming. I move that we commemorate Peyton Smith's life by naming the field and having a relevant and, and uh, delightful dedication. And can I just, can we just add to that, um, Mara, that we're going to pay for um, the plaque out of fund balance? Out of the fund balance, yeah. Second. Second. Any discussion? I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. Thanks, guys. Thanks for um, taking the lead on this and uh, paying respect to a life it seems like touched touched many. So yeah. sorry for your loss. Thank you for being supportive of it. Yeah, yeah I just want to say thank you as well to Aiden and Nicholas and Oliver. It's really great that you guys are here. <laughs> that you want to honor your friend this way. I'm really impressed with all of you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Right. Um, Agate, a... Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Uh, Jerry? Aye. Mia? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Uh, Mara? Aye. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much. This is a really, really touching thing that you've all done. And um, we're glad we could help in this way and um, hope that this helps his, his memory live on and helps you remember and celebrate um, his life. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you. We'll share the news with the family and, um, you know, Libby will be in touch, you know, as the uh, winter goes on to put us the plaque together. Yeah, Renee awesome. and Matt will be on it. I bet Matt McQueen will be on it too. So Renee yeah. and Matt will be on it in order to get, get in touch with these guys to make sure that the, the whatever sign we create matches what you guys want. That'd be awesome. And, you know, one other little nice note about it is that Peyton's younger brother, Keegan, is a freshman at school and will be playing baseball this year. So he'll get to be playing on his Older brothers. Wow. All right. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, it's 
um, it's touching when we get to do things like that, which is, um, or yeah, glad glad Brian organized that. That was that was wonderful. Um, with uh, Bridget's departure, uh, not only did we lose a fantastic board member, we also lost our vice chair. Um, so we do need to appoint a uh, new vice chair. Um, and then there are a couple committee appointments that we talked about that we needed to finalize that have, that have totally escaped my brain. Appointing someone to the SRO committee and then a possible appointment for Mia, which may be one and the same, um, unless we want to punt on that. On the vice chair, um, Andrew has expressed interest and willingness to step into that role. Uh, uh, I think he would be a, a fantastic choice if the rest of the board is supportive, but I also, um, you know, if, if someone else uh, is interested, um, I don't want to, uh, foreclose that opportunity either. But uh, if we're willing to take Andrew up on his offer, I think it would be, be great to have him serve as, as vice chair. Um, and shockingly, he is now one of the more senior members of the board. Uh, um, so I, I will, uh, if, if someone else is interested, um, now, is, now is the time to express it. Um, otherwise, it would be great to entertain a motion to appoint um, Andrew as, as vice chair for the remainder of uh, the, the year, which, which would be till uh, town meeting day. I move we appoint Andrew Stein as the vice chair of the Montpelier Roxbury School Board of Directors. I'll second that. Okay. Um, any discussion? I have, a, I have a new board member question. Yes. What does what does the vice chair do? Uh, the vice chair basically serves as the chair when when the chair is is stuck under a rock or something. Um, <laughs> so uh, that is that is the that's I think the primary um, thing. But they could, he can also sign, for instance, um, yeah, every. Uh, every couple of weeks, we have to do a warrant for the payroll. Um, so the vice chair can also sign the warrant if the chair is unavailable. Basically, it's it's someone who's who can um, do chair functions when when the chair is unavailable. Both you know shepherd meetings, and then uh, you know there are there are things like contracts and whatnot that the chair needs to sign, and the vice chair can sign in the, the chair's absence. Andrew would be Kamala Harris. Yes, I love it. What a compliment. Um, uh, Anagat? Aye. Uh, Ryan? Aye. Uh, Jill? Aye. Gary? Aye. Mia? Aye. Tina? She's not on the board, Jim. <laughs> 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 I knew that would happen at least once. I did hear that there was an opening after tonight, though. I don't know. I, I just want to put that out there. I did hear that. Andrew? I was waiting. I was waiting for Jim to say the vice chair does whatever the chair wants him to do. Well, I want. That, I'm going to tell Andrew after the vote. <laughs> yes. Uh, Mara. Hi. And Andrew, did I give you a chance to vote on yourself? Uh, yeah, hi. I'm happy to do it. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Thank yeah, no, you. And thank you for stepping up. Um, are we ready to? Um, is any is anyone super interested in the in serving on the SRO committee? Um, to be frank, I'm very interested, but I've learned from past experience that volunteering for more than two committees, especially when one of them is the negotiations committee and you're in the heat of things is not a good recipe for work-life balance. So. And now you're a vice chair? <laughs> yeah. 
So I just want to say that interested, yes, but I'm not going to put my name forward. Not to put you on the spot, Mia, but are you already appointed to other committees? I know sometimes that happens outside of the meetings, but I, I do think it would be great to have you on there if, if possible. But. And we could make that your only committee until that committee wraps up, which I think is going to go at least till March. So if you're interested, I think you'd be fantastic as well. Um, Before we get too crazy, we've lost half of the policy committee with Mara's departure. Um, yeah, so we're down to, we had been a four, and now we're down to a two-person committee. It would just be Emma and I. Um, right. So we don't have to choose right now, but it would be nice to have at least one other body I'm helping out with some of the policy work going forward. So. Yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to go um, back on policy. I know I was on it for a little while and it wasn't particularly helpful, but maybe over time I can, I can, be more useful. Other than that, I, 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 to Andrew's point, I'm on the negotiation committee and, and I don't want to overcommit, um, which is why I wouldn't necessarily want to step up to the, the SRO community forum, but I would be happy to serve on the policy committee if that's helpful. And one, one quick question, this is a little bit of a digression, but it feeds into this, Jim, while we're talking about this, because some of, some of these decisions are based on the fact that our highly valued board director Mara is leaving, which I'm very sad about um, going back to that. But um, since we just had a bunch of really qualified candidates come forward, could we do an expedited round of this? Like say, hey, if you're interested, reach out in the next, you know, 10 days um, and we could appoint somebody at our next board meeting. We could reach out to the three people that had just expressed interest. And I, I'm in the process of doing that. Um, yeah. And I know you, you uh, yeah, and feel free to, to reach out as well, but hopefully we can get, it'd be great if we get all three of those to, to throw their hats back into the ring. Um, because what I'm thinking, Ryan, to your point is if Mia, for example, joined the SRO committee, which has more, more frequent work right now and more and a lot of time sensitive work, we might be able to then appoint somebody to the policy committee at our next meeting um, or have an idea as to who that person would be. No, and I think that's totally relevant. I think you're gonna have a hard time twisting elbows with the group that's in the meeting right now to get more committed between negotiations and prior um, committee appointments. So yeah, we'll make that known in the announcement that goes out for uh, Mara's replacement that <laughs> Committee seats will be expected to be filled with your presence. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, anyway, the, the SRO committee is rolling and we need to get somebody into that. Yeah. And Yeah, I would agree. The, and the uh, superintendent evaluation committee, um, I think we're gonna talk about that next time. I actually have to drop because I have a meeting, but um, I'm in with, I sent um, Jim the documentation for yeah. this round and hopefully, you know, I'm fine to do that as much yeah. and I, until we get somebody. Yeah, and I think we're uh, planning to talk about that next meeting or the meeting. Next or, meeting, uh, yeah. So I'm gonna drop up, so yeah. see Great. everyone. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Thanks. So if people yeah. wanna think about the SRO committee, why don't I propose this, that we give people some time and what, you know, I think waiting until the next meeting, there's probably going to be some movement on the SRO committee, but um, I think someone could step up and attend the meetings and then we could appoint them formally afterwards because they're open meetings. And I, I think someone could, you know, sit through one not formally appointed, one or two. Um, Jim, or we, we could appoint Mia right now if she's interested to the SRO. If, if Mia's interested, I, I definitely would, would be interested in appointing her, but I don't want to, I also want to give her some time to think about it if she wants time to think about it. Um, Mia, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> Mara, is your um, resignation effective immediately or are you sticking around sort of like Bridget did for a few more I'm, I'm planning to attend the meeting, uh, the, uh, the safety committee meeting tomorrow. And then after that, it'll be effective immediately. Okay. 
And I totally think that you should take that position. And I'm definitely not, you know, strong arming you at all with love. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'll do it. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think we need a, a motion to appoint Mia to the um, SRO committee. Um, I, I move to appoint Mia to the SRO committee when Mara has finished her term tomorrow so that we don't have more board members on the committee at once than we had initially said we would. Um, does that make sense yes. with that qualification? Yeah. Just, why don't we just make the appointment effective November 20th? Perfect. Yeah, so I move to appoint Mia to the SRO committee effective November 20th. Do I have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Um, Atticut? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mia? I didn't think I'd get to vote on myself. Um, aye. <laughs> Andrew? Aye. And Mara. Aye. Great. Thank you, Mia. And, and thank you, Andrew. Um, and Jill, on the policy committee, do you do you want to step up on that or do you want to wait and see? Um, I, don't think I can, I can wait. I can wait, wait until we have another person on board. That's fine. And just know I can be plan B. Okay, perfect. Um, Let's do that unless unless you are like I want to serve on the policy committee, please. Uh, then um, we can we we can we can wait on that. Um, and do we want to set a date for when we want to make a decision on the the board member? Um, our next meeting is the second, right, Libby? I. I say we, I think we should aim for the second. If, if those three candidates are interested and we put it out and we get another candidate or two, great. Or even if we, if we get one or two of those candidates, great. Let's do that. Let's, let's put it on the second. And if we um, don't have much of a candidate pool on the second, we can always extend it. Okay. Great, and maybe I can I can work with Anna and Libby to put out another another announcement. We got that. Anna's already doing it right now. I can guarantee you. Excellent. Thank <laughs> you, Anna. Um, and then budget priorities from community input. Uh, first off, Jill, thank you so much for stepping up and, and shepherding that meeting. Um, Andrew and I were both stuck under rocks at that uh, uh, at that point, but now I got oh, I got pleasure. pulled into some some work um, work calls. Um, so I just want to give a quick summary of what what we heard, um, and I know that uh, some document there was a survey and some documents were circulated, but. I don't know, Jill, do you want to just give a quick two minute overview of, of, um, of the feedback? Sure. So the, um, the survey had a pretty good response rate and that was really helpful. And I know um, I can put it into a, a visual, which was really helpful, which a few of us got this afternoon. It looked like before the meeting um, with sort of the big high level priorities, you know, about like um, special education, early childhood, after school, um, social emotional learning, you know, there were several sort of categories and, and folks were asked to rank that. And then there was um, a place where people could add, um, you know, either things that they felt hadn't been addressed or things they wanted to emphasize. And so that included everything from um, requesting, we consider the budgetary impact of pandemic response, things like ventilation, things like that. Um, after school programming, music, art, theater, and foreign language. Um, after school had had plenty of comments. Um, there were also some sort of resource specific things like um, AP classes, um, library books and textbooks, um, 
facilities. Um, and then and uh, there were definitely certainly comments about diversity, equity, inclusion, and, and not supporting the school resource officer position. Um, but there was pretty widespread theme of um, emphasizing social, emotional, and mental health for, um, for students and families and prioritizing our budget to um, the most disadvantaged students and families. Um, so, and then we had a really good conversation. There were just a handful of folks that were on the call, but they had really great comments. Um, we had someone who offered up that there was a new bus service coming to Montpelier that might be a good resource for middle and high school students. Um, there was a gentleman who sort of drew the parallel to um, what he went through as an educator, you know, back in the 70s and 80s about sort of schools were kind of caught on their heels and weren't prepared to address some of the sort of change in cultural um, tidal waves that were coming regarding sexuality and drugs and alcohol and that this was sort of our opportunity to be a little bit more prepared and proactive um, in supporting students and really investing in um, counselors and um, and guidance for students and training and investing in staff training for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and then a lot of conversation too about, you know, history and how the, the lens through which we're teaching a lot of these courses has changed and sort of the career pathways that are open to students has also changed. Um, Jerry's not on anymore, but she had a really great point about, you know, the changing technology and that we're gonna need students with a balance of, of science and ethics um, to sort of shepherd that to the future. So um, it, was, it was really an interesting conversation and I do think it was supportive of a lot of the things that we had been talking about. Um, I think it was helpful. Um, it was great that we had a good feedback to the survey because there were, I think maybe four or five community members on the call. So we did wrap that up a little early, um, but I found it really helpful and, and engaging. It was a really great group that was on. I don't know if anyone has any other questions or things that I didn't um, address. Yeah, questions for Jill. I know there are a few other people on. Um, any other observations? I just wanted to say first to you, Jill, thank you for being so prepared for that town hall. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> you um, presented to the town hall, essentially, for those board members who weren't there, presented to the town hall, essentially, what she just told us. And I just was, thought that was a really great way to set a good grounding for, for the conversation. So thank you for doing thank that. Um, and just one other one that I had notes on was um, we heard from the crossing guard as well with, I guess, well, advocating for making sure crossing guards were included in the budget, which we know they will definitely be as a safety feature. And, uh, and then also had just a few questions um, about how um, salary and benefits work. Um, so Libby committed to taking that offline and, and connecting with, um, with the, the crossing guards on that. So thanks for doing that, Libby. Great. Any other um, comments on that? Otherwise, we can uh, give Susan the floor of the board communications training, which um, has been great in the past. And with so many new board members, uh, I think will be super valuable. So. Susan, why don't I hand it over to you? And um, I don't know if you want to share a screen, but uh, Libby, is she set up to do that if she needs to? You can make it work, Susan. If you need anything and we can't get it to work, then just we'll figure it out. Yeah. yeah. OK. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've gotten very flexible about Zoom meetings. <laughs> you do what works. Um, so. I recognize a few of you from a couple of years ago when I came and met with your board and then I don't recognize some of you. So let me introduce myself. I'm Susan Holson from the SBA. That's Vermont School Boards Association, which is actually just around the corner from the high school. Um, although I have been working from home since March. So I haven't been in Montpelier. Um, let me, uh, my role at VSBA is the Director of Education Services, which pretty much means I do most of the professional development work for school board members. And that is one of 
the core principal pieces of our mission at the School Boards Association, of which you are members. And so all of the resources that we have are available to all of you as members. And before I get into anything, I would just like to say, every time I've come to one of your meetings, I have been blown away by your student representatives who serve on your board. And I don't get to see them tonight, but boy, that presentation from those kids really tugged at my heart. Um, you've got an amazing group of students and you're smart and fortunate to have them come to your meetings so you can remember what it is you're doing all this work for. Now, having said that, um, Libby had gotten in touch with me and asked me to sort of go through communication protocols for board members um, because when you're wearing multiple hats, things sometimes get really confusing and uh, it, it's sometimes hard to remember which hat you've got on when and what the ramifications are. So I've really geared this mostly towards your newer board members because she did also um, let me know that you're in transition and it sounds like that's continuing and you do have a lot of, of new members. So I welcome those of you who, we, who have been around for a while to chime in if you've got any thoughts or suggestions. And at the same time, I wanna say, once I share my screen, this is I think the biggest failure of Zoom. Once I share my screen, I can no longer see who's here or I can't see your hands raised or anything else. So don't worry about interrupting me please feel free to do that. Chime in with questions or comments or just tell me to slow down. I've got about 40 minutes, I think, and I'm gonna race through this, um, but I wanna make sure that it, it penetrates. So if I'm going too fast, we won't go through it all and we'll just take our time and, and make sure that it all makes sense to you. That works for everyone? Okay, good. So I will host disabled participant screen sharing. Hmm, will somebody give me permission? I don't know who, you, who the meeting host is. Is it you, Libby? All right, try again. Oh, that works. Thank All right, you. There you go. Excellent. All right, so. Um, are you seeing the presenter view or are you seeing the whole thing? We've got the, the presenter view. view. Yeah, okay. we've got the presenter well, view. We'll, all right, we'll fine with me. But... Yeah, we'll go back. Okay, um, so uh, really the question that I, I think the core question here is what do I say and when do I say it and to whom do I say it? And more importantly, maybe when don't I say anything? Um, so that's sort of the premise that I'm starting with. And we're gonna sort of walk through some different scenarios to figure out how to get there. And this is really um, one lens that is looking at the school board role, what you are as a board and what you are as a board member to your community. Um, so we're sort of coming in the back door here, talking about roles and responsibilities through the lens of specifically communication. But it, remember that's part of a much bigger picture. And everything we're gonna talk about tonight is really based on the proprietary platform that the Vermont School Boards Association has developed over years um, of what the essential work of Vermont School Boards is. And for those of you who are new members, if this book on the right-hand side of the screen doesn't look familiar, I have a case of them in my trunk. We have cartons of them at the office um, and I strongly encourage anyone who doesn't have one, you, you should get one, they're 15 bucks. We charge it to the SU. Um, Libby can put in an order or any of you can just let us know, send me an email or whatever. Um, it runs through all of the best practices and gives some rationale behind them. And so it's a handy resource. You know, I'm not gonna say you're gonna read it cover to cover, but if it's on the shelf and you have some questions and you can just 
pull on it, that's helpful. And the piece on the left of the screen is our um, online adaptation of that. We have a toolkit on the Vermont School Boards Association website and it's all um, linked to resources. So that's just sort of an aside, but that's the lens that I'm coming at this with. So there's lots of different types of communication and they obviously just keep exploding and I didn't even list them all here. I mean, I, I've left out texting and I've left out social media that I don't even understand and I'm sure a lot of other things. But as we know, there's lots of different ways to communicate. And, and the one thing that I think is really important to remember for all communication, especially as you're sitting in your school board seat, is that communication is two way. There's, it's not a one way deal, right? I mean, I, I like to, that's the co of communication, even though I know that's not the origin of the word. And if you're a Greek scholar, you'll probably get upset with me for doing that. But no matter what form it takes, you got to be listening and you are contributing also. And, and so regardless of how you're communicating, what you're saying and how you're presenting the board in what you're saying are important. Um, and, and that's where it sometimes gets murky because your personal opinions on things and the board's opinions on things may not be the same. And while you are on the board and people are approaching you because you're on the board and they know you're a board member, they're talking to you as a board member and you need to remember that. So, you know, the first thing we think of with communication with the community is people aren't happy and that's when they get in touch. And there's a lot of truth to that, right? So if somebody's gonna communicate with you, send you an email, stop you on the street, text you, whatever it may be, um, you're gonna take a complaint from, a, from somebody in the community about the schools. That's, you're gonna hear that. What are you gonna do with that? Well, you actually have a policy in your policy manual, <clears throat> expectations for, your, for board members. And in that policy, it outlines your chain of command for this exact situation, um, which is that you are going to tell the board chair, you're gonna let Jim know and you're gonna let Libby know that you have received a complaint. Or maybe you're gonna let Jim know and he'll take it up with Libby. I'm not sure how your board works on that particular thing. Either one of those is sort of left to the, the way an individual board structures itself. You're not gonna respond to that complaint because as soon as you do, the person on the other side of that is hearing, oh, well, the, the school board told me, blah, 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 blah. And that's not true, right? You're not speaking for the board in that situation. So you have to be really, really careful. Sometimes it's okay to follow up later if this is a personal connection of yours. Um, you know, just did, did everything work out? You know, did, did you get the answers you needed? Did you get that taken care of? Um, and sometimes it's not appropriate to follow up because it's a more contentious thing or it's a deeper dive or it's gonna end up in some sort of union grievance or God knows what. And so, you just want to stay back. And the main reason for all of this is because if in the event there's an appeal of some kind, some policy related matter didn't go according to policy and procedures, there's a reason for it, somebody's appealing about it. Once they go to the teacher, to the building administrators, come to the central office and, and deal with Libby. If, they, if a parent still isn't satisfied, you as the school board are their last line of defense. They will issue a formal complaint to you and you will sit as a quasi judicial body to hear all of the evidence, just like you're a, a, a judge, collectively you're a judge. <clears throat> and if you are too involved up until that point, you can't really be impartial. And that means you really have to recuse yourself. So get out of the way, stay out of the way. And then if you need to be pulled in, you can be pulled in effectively. Make sense? All right. So this 
part of your policy on handling complaints. Complaints or criticisms received by individual board members go to the board chair. Um, and then you're gonna direct somebody to follow the policy and you'll let the superintendent, that, or this says, okay, the chair will let the superintendent know about a complaint. So let's, let's think about it this way. Here, here's a little case study, okay? Um, you run into one of your neighbors while you're shopping and she approaches you and she just goes off about online learning, how ineffective it is. Her son is not learning anything. His teacher doesn't know what she's doing with online learning. How can this be happening? How, how are we going to do this? She's not engaged. The teacher's not engaged. And I want the board to do something about this. What do you say? That's a real question. What do you say? Thank you. Okay. Uh, that we hear her and ask if she's spoken with her student's teacher or principal. Great. Mm -hmm. and, and you might want to soften it a little bit with, you know, this is a really tough time and everybody is learning to manage as we go. Um, what is it that they're, the expression they're using in the governor's office? We're building the airplane while we're flying it, you know? And, and for some teachers, that's what the online learning really, I mean, that's how it, it hit them initially anyway. But you stay detached and you reference them back to that chain of command. That's really the important thing. And if this is somebody that, you know, how do you leave it with her? I'll check with you next week to make sure everything, you know, you're getting some, some satisfaction. That sort of implies that you're going to take some action. So this might be a time for some education. You know, the board just doesn't handle these kinds of matters. This is not board business. This is really for the superintendent or the building principal. So those are the channels that you really need to pursue. This is not something the board can, can take hold of. But then you need to make sure that you let Jim know that this happened, right? And, and give him the details. Similarly, if it comes in by email, forward the email to him. Jim, I just received this. And the same kind of simple response back, you know, have you talked to the teacher or to the building administrator? I mean, if it's a complaint about a classroom teacher, they may not feel comfortable talking directly to the teacher about it, but have you talked to the principal? You know, the same kind of thing. Why? First of all, you're following your existing policies. You know, the board creates policies and then you live by them and the entire district lives by your policies. So you want to make sure that you're following them, right? That, that's, that's the starting point. And to Jill's point, and whoever it was, I'm, I didn't see who spoke first when you said you thank them. You do want to acknowledge that, they, that you're hearing what they're saying. You're not just dismissing them out of hand, but you are kind of delaying to let them know this isn't your, your work here. So one of the fundamental principles that I think board members really struggle with a lot is this whole idea that you speak with one voice. People struggle with this because there are seven of you. Did I get that right? How many board members? When you're full complement? Seven, eight, something like that. Um, and, and yeah, Libby? Nine. Nine. I was close. <laughs> um, so it's hard for nine people to have one voice, right? But as an elected body, that's exactly the structure. You have a, a, as a body, you are an entity. But as a board member in the eyes of the law, you're nothing. You're just another citizen. Um, and so there, as I said earlier, you really do run that risk of, well, the board said even, if you're not feeling like you're representing the board at that moment. So that one voice principle is something that board members struggle with because they think that their first amendment rights are being curtailed. Well, I'm still a citizen, I can still speak my voice. Well, you can, 
but it's really, really hard to take off your board hat when you're public facing. If they're coming to you as a board member, they know you're a board member and they think you're speaking for the board. No matter how many times you try and clear that up, that's what people are gonna hear. So that's a really important thing. And when I say people, I mean anybody, I mean parents, I mean teachers. If you go in for your parent teacher or you have a conference with your, your kid's teacher, um, because it's parent teacher conference time or because there's an issue, you know, you've got to really remind them and remind yourself, I'm here as a parent today. Let's talk about Jane and only about Jane. And, you know, you don't have to say this, but we're not going to talk about your contract negotiations and we're not going to talk about your health insurance. And we're not, we're, we're going to talk about Jane, my kid, I'm here as her parent. Right. And, and so that's really the only time I think that you can completely take off your board hat. And when you do that, I recommend that you are very, very clear about it. You know, hit it over the head. So the school boards are created by the state, right? We're granted power based on the Vermont statutes. And as I said, you have no individual power or authority in statute. So you're not above the law. Nobody is above the law, right? Um, and again, going back to your policy, um, your expectation policy, board members do not speak for the board, but speak as individuals when interacting with other non-board entities or to the public. That's fine. It's important for you to understand that, but I think it's at least as important for you to understand that most people don't realize that. Um, and so best practice is to have somebody and, and your policy, it's the board chair becomes the board spokesperson. So if somebody that, which is why you're going to refer all of the, any correspondence that you get to the chair, because Jim is your spokesperson. He's the one who's going to put the message out there that is the board's point of view. And that by having only one person do it, it it's consistent, right? And he is speaking based on what he has observed and processed as being the will of the board. Got that, Jim? <laughs> All right, so here's another, another little case study. And based on the conversation I just heard, maybe I'm not that far off the mark with this one. So you show up at your board meeting, you're gonna vote on the, the proposed budget. You're looking at a two and a half percent budget for next year, and it looks pretty good. And you go into the meeting planning to vote for it. But Libby shows up and she says, you know what? This COVID thing is out of control all over the state. I think we better plan for the possibility that we're gonna be all remote. Now you think about that and you say, well, that sounds important. But what does that mean? Well, it means a big investment in technology um, to make sure everybody and every piece of equipment is up to speed to catch all of the nuances of, of the online learning. And that's gonna mean more money. It's gonna raise your budget by about a full point. So you're now looking at a three and a half percent. And you think, uh-uh, that's not gonna fly. People aren't gonna support that. It's too big an increase in this, in this economic climate. We're, we're never gonna be able to sell that. And so you vote against it. But at the end of the day, I guess I did know you had nine people because I came up with a, at the end of the day, the vote of the board is six, three in favor of this amended budget. So one of your meet, neighbors is sitting there at the meeting and as you're walking out at the end of the meeting, he comes over and he says, um, so you didn't support the budget. I'm, I'm kind of confused, should I vote for this? And then the next morning you get a call from the Times Argus wanting, they also know that you did not support the budget, but they want to, they want to hear your, your feelings about it. So what do you say to your neighbor? Okay, as an individual, you did not support the budget, but it passed. What do you say?
the board has approved a budget that we think will do, should we say, quality educational opportunities for our children. And that is the budget we're going to present to our communities to support. And so it wasn't a unanimous vote, but overall the board as a whole had decided that the budget was appropriate for our communities and for our students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and another, another, my general thought on this, Susan, this is Andrew speaking, Thank is you. that people don't give up their First Amendment rights um, when they're board members. And so they can, I, I think, I think this is best practice. And what Ryan's saying is generally best practice. But I think another approach, depending on how one feels, is somebody could say, while I did not vote for the budget because of X, Y, and Z, and that was based on my personal beliefs and opinions of the situation, I support the board as a whole. The board has the ultimate authority and the board at large voted to approve this budget and present it to voters. And so as a member of the board, I'm, I'm supportive of where we are um, on this. Yep, that works too. Um, and, and if it really is the way I laid it out, you could even say, yeah, I voted against it because I'm concerned about the community's ability to support an expanded budget. There's nothing in that budget that I think is inappropriate for our kids, right? So you can clarify a little bit of your actions and, and, and then go on to what Ryan was saying. And this is the board's will and I support it. I support that this is what the board is bringing forward. What about the media? What do you do when the, the newspaper calls? I would direct them to Jim. Yay, good answer, I like that one. Right, and, and they're probably calling you because they think they're gonna be able to churn up some dirt, right? Ooh, yes, you know, it wasn't a unanimous vote. Here's an opportunity, let's get some, let's get some headlines, let's, let's sell some papers here, right? Let's get that strife going, people love that stuff. Don't play. You know, nobody can have a fight if you, with themselves. Right, so if you don't play, they can't fight. Um, so yeah, so the takeaways from this are majority rules, that's the board's action. And outside of the board meeting, you gotta be really clear again, you're speaking for yourself, but the board supports this budget to Andrew's point. So to the neighbor, I didn't, you know, I didn't vote in support of it in the meeting and you can offer an explanation or not, but I do support, support the budget because this is how the majority voted. And this is, you know, the board chose to move this way. And exactly as Emma said to the media, you know, our chair, Jim Murphy is our spokesperson. Here's, here's how to reach him. He represents the board's point of view, done. So unless you're the chair, you don't wanna see your name in print, right? Especially if they're attributing a quote. So some of this gets even murkier when we throw the overlay of public, of open meeting law on, onto board business. And for those of you who are newer board members, if you haven't been involved in other public, um, public bodies, open meeting law went into effect. I'm going to say it was eh, like maybe 10 years ago that it really got stringent, eight, 10 years, something like that. And it's the, the underlying premise is you are elected to conduct the people's business and you're accountable to them. And therefore you need to be transparent. And that's why you're agendas and your warnings all need to be at least five days before your meeting and they have to be posted in public places. There are a whole lot of very specific things around open meeting law. We could spend two hours just talking about that, but I'm not going to. I, I'm just gonna touch on some pieces of open meeting law where it rubs with um, the board communication. So, okay, you're a public body you need transparency, that's at the heart of it. So anytime a quorum holds a meeting, you need to 
have minutes, you need to warn the meeting, have an agenda, have that agenda publicly available. There are different time periods allowed and, and somebody needs to be taking minutes which also need to be posted even before they're approved at the next meeting. Draft minutes need to be posted, again, somewhere that's easily accessible to anybody who wants them. Um, and that, by the way, and I spell that out on this slide, that includes board committees. If it is a board committee, you are bound by open meeting law. If you, as a board member, are serving on another committee, let's say it's a select board committee of some kind, they're subject to open meeting law, but you don't need to be. If you're serving on the um, Boy Scouts Council Committee, you're, that's not a public body. And so even though you're a board member who's placed there to be the conduit with the school board, you're not subject to open meeting laws in that context. And, and there's language in the law about that. And so they define meetings and they define, the, and there's actually what is a meeting and what is not a meeting. Um, so a meeting can occur anywhere. It's a work session, it's a retreat, it's any kind of meeting of this board or subset of a quorum subset of this board. And it doesn't need to all take place in, in one time and place. So email strings, social media discussions, all of that stuff, right? And here's one little exception. So you can send a group email, Jim or Libby can send out an email, are there thoughts for the agenda for the next meeting? Here's the draft. I'm attaching the draft. Anybody have anything you wanna add, delete, subtract, clarify, whatever. You can have that conversation about the agenda in group emails, but you may not discuss any business of the board in that email. So if you have, if you want clarity around an agenda item, you can ask for clarity, but it's going to stop short of discussing the item. It needs to stop short. And one tip that I actually learned from VSBA, which I think is a great one, is when most of the group emails here will, will be initiated either by the central office, by Libby or Anna, or by Jim. And in all cases, if you, instead of copying everybody, if you blind copy everybody, there's no such thing as reply all. If you reply all and people are blind copied on it, they don't get the reply. So that's a very safe way to structure a group email to make sure that you stay within those boundaries of open meeting law. Are there questions about that? Su Susan, I have a question. This is, yeah. this is Mia. Um, we just held a town hall, budget town hall, just before this meeting. Mm -hmm. We didn't make any decisions in that at that town hall. It was really just to gather information from the public. Mm -hmm. So but does that fall into, obviously it was, it was being held as an essentially open to be part of a transparent process, but I'm just curious about minutes and all those kinds of things. Like how stringent do we, we voted to adjourn, I think just to be on the safe side maybe, but just I'm curious how is that, was that truly a meeting of the board? That's a great question. And I am going to give you my best answer, but I'm going to also check in with my colleagues who are attorneys and specialists in open meeting law. And I'm gonna give you the right answer by email tomorrow, okay? Let me just make myself a note. So, um, so you know, we warned that and we had a quorum of the board. Okay, yeah. So if you have a quorum of the board um, and you are discussing board business in the sense that you were getting the public's input on budget. Um, it, it is a public meeting, um, but if minutes there, so there are really specific things that need to be included in minutes. And 
a whole long explanation of discussion need not be in the minutes. What needs to be in the minutes, as you said, Mia, is when there are actions. You know, there's a motion, a second, a vote. That needs to be in the minutes. Who made the motion? Who made the second? And, and how did the vote go? Um, but I don't believe you need to give lengthy description in minutes about discussion. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank but you. But I'm, I'm also, I, I am going to get an answer and I'll send Jim an email tomorrow once I have an answer to that for sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think the, the point that I'm just, a, that's still a little confusing to me is that whether or not we made any decisions feels to me like a defining characteristic of a meeting, but I would, so I would love a little more mm -hmm. clarification on that. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Thank you. Um, I, I can also direct you, um, there are on our website, we did a really, I thought very informal, informative um, webinar last, in this last winter before the pandemic um, about open meeting law. And it was held, there were two presenters. One was our executive director, Sue Siglowski, who's an attorney. And the other was the deputy secretary of state. And he was great. And the two of them together dealt with a lot of the, the minutia issues and answered a lot of very specific questions. And all of our webinars are archived on our website. And, and the PowerPoint deck that they used is also there. So uh, you might want to take a closer look at that at some point. It, it ran about an hour. Hey, Susan, yeah. Ryan here. Yeah. Could I ask you to expand maybe a little bit on open meeting law and distribution of materials? Mm -hmm. um, policy committee gets itself stuck in some gray areas frequently. Um, the way we tend to operate is we'd have somebody who might be a lead author on a draft policy. Um, we would warn a meeting of the policy committee to discuss that draft policy. So the lead author would distribute whatever had been authored so far. Um, in advance of the meeting, the other committee members would have a chance to read it and make comments, but nothing would be shared back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so we would make comments, we would make edits as a group in an open meeting. That's fine. The question that we're kind of bumping up against that we don't have a solid answer for is how files might be stored um, so as board members, we all have access to the district's online drives. If we have a folder that draft policies are jointly available to all policy committee members, is that an okay um, procedure or an okay? I believe that is okay as long as nobody is working on them. If they're just stored there, that should be fine because you're only advancing them in public meeting. Is there any time that there might be a file, um, an informational organizational file to keep track of adoption dates, revisions um, that could be jointly edited throughout without open meeting law? No. So there's no point in time that board members could have access to a document that would be um, opened or edited or changed outside of an openly warned meeting. Correct. Okay. And Susan, sorry, just to follow up on that question, this is Mara. Um, what would we have to do to change that? <laughs> You'd have to change the open meeting law. Right, and that, and that, so that go, that would be something to, to to discuss with legislature themselves. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Um, I don't, uh, frankly, I don't see that happening. <laughs> but good luck. I mean, if you if you really want to pursue that, good luck. I I, I think um, you know, and and let's remember, legislature is bound by open meeting law also, um, and it is an inconvenience for a public body to adhere to some of the really stringent requirements, um, but it is all done with the intent of accountability. 
Oh yeah, definitely agree. I just, um, I keep thinking about like the view all capacity and if things were made publicly available to be act accessed and viewed at any time, not that I need to tell you this to you because you can't change anything, but uh, that is, that's something that uh, I feel like it's not worth setting the issue down when we are in 2020 and electronic communication and co-work is part of the reality of how we function. I understand that completely. And, and I know the frustrations of, of not being able to just make those changes in the Google Doc rather than marking up a copy for yourself and being able to discuss them in the committee meeting. I understand it, it's not efficient, um, but it is transparent that way. So it's, so, a, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's bulky. I have a follow up as well, because we're, so you're hearing from the policy committee right here. We've had Great. a lot of talks around this. Um, but one other question that I had was, um, I thought, I thought you also mentioned that you could email back and forth with a quorum of the board of, to develop an agenda. Now, would that be true with a shared Google doc that you would be able to develop that agenda? You know, as long as you're not making any decisions or trying to build consensus, would you be able to collaborate on so like, the, say an agenda. The official answer is I don't know, but I think you're getting into the weeds when you start to do that because generally speaking, any um, shared authoring that isn't happening simultaneously in public is suspect. It is yeah, it, it's going to raise red flags. If you're doing that, what else are you doing? Yeah. Um, even if you're not doing anything else. Uh, so the, and I don't think it's all that much more cumbersome for either Jim or Libby to send out the draft agenda and say, please send me your feedback. You know, if there's anything you want to add, because at the end of the day, they have, um, it's their choice whether something's going to go on the agenda or not. So if you add it on, that doesn't mean it's going to stay there. Yeah, yeah no, and that's that's the way to deal with the agenda. Is, you know, if you see the agenda, you want something added, you have questions, you know, email uh, Libby and me, and um, we'll either add it or we'll explain why it can't be added. And if you disagree at the beginning of the meeting, you can say, I want to add this to the agenda and, you know, Bring it to the board. Um, if you guys want, I just pulled up the Secretary of State updated um, Jim Condos, his office updated their uh, open meeting open meeting guide last year, and they have um, a section on collective editing of online documents. Do you want me to email that out to everyone or read that? What? And, and this is just the Secretary of State, but he is the official. Correct. Managing Vermont's democracy. So, no, no, the, uh, he's my resource. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, he's he's the definitive. Yeah, especially since office. we're all working remotely the, this way, and they're probably going to continue to collaborate this way for a while. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Uh, the crux of it is that they don't. Re re he doesn't recommend. The office does not recommend that a quorum of a public body should participate in collectively editing a document um, because we can't. We can't assume, for example, that all members of the public will have the skills or means to access a tool such as Google Docs or be able to offer their opinions on the views exchanged. In our view, an acceptable alternative is to instead name a point person who collects and compiles each member's comments for later discussion at a duly worn meeting. But this is this kind of falls outside of some of what you're talking about, I think, Emma. And it, it I I totally get where you're coming from, Mara, with regard to this is like the most inefficient way to do business in the 21st century when we're all holed up at home and we're working this digital sphere. So how to balance, you know, the efficiency of doing this work with transparency, accountability, and accessibility. It's not, it's a, it's a fine needle to thread, but I do think it's worth prodding at because many of these laws are older. I will also um, remind those of you who don't know that when the pandemic hit, 
the there were temporary modifications made to open meeting law um, to allow, for example, this meeting tonight. The base open meeting law, which we're going to go back to when the, the state of emergency is over, says you can hold a remote meeting, but one person of the body, of the public body, must be in a central location attending the meeting there where the public can also gather. Now that's been pushed aside temporarily and instead we're sharing Zoom links, but every meeting still has to be open publicly and you have to have some mechanism for public comment and and then it complicates the whole executive session question too, right? How do you do that? Making sure that you're only board members or invited people into your executive session. So there, there's another challenge there, but they did make some temporary modifications. Um, and may I compliment Jim, um, because I've gone to a lot of Zoom board meetings in the last six months, and you are one of the very few who is actually doing the roll call voice vote for every motion, which is what the um, parameters are for digital meetings now. And so thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, this, this, this is a rat's nest. Open meeting law has so many ramifications and, and boards get into um, some weeds about this with certain issues. And one of them is that um, group editing question. It comes up all the time. It seems so wrong uh, on some level and yet the intent makes the, the protocols at least understandable. So executive session is another one. This is where most boards get into trouble with open meeting law. The open meeting law lists 14 very specific reasons for executive session and only those 14. And if, the, if you vote to go into executive session, you really need to include in the motion the language, specific language in open meeting law that covers which of those 14 is the reason for your open meeting, uh, for your executive committee. Uh, sorry, executive session. Why are you closing this to the public? Well, because premature knowledge, let's say you're um, negotiating with the new bus company or something, uh, premature knowledge could influence the outcome of that negotiation. And so that's one of the rationales. I'm not gonna go through the particulars, but it, the motion needs to state the nature of the business why you're in executive session and be and, and you have to vote on that. Are we going into executive session? And that motion needs to be in your minutes. <clears throat> if when you're in executive session, you don't take minutes because you don't make any decisions in executive session, any information in executive session, any discussion, it needs to, first of all, remain confidential, first and foremost. You can't tell anybody what you talked about. Forgetting the outcomes, you just can't even say, oh yeah, well, we were talking about a bus contract. Nope. Executive session, closed door. It's up to the board to decide who you might want to invite in with you to executive session. So if this is a personnel issue that around three people, you might wanna have all three, but only if it meets the parameters of the, one of those 14 reasons. Don't take minutes in the executive session because then it's, you run the risk of losing the confidentiality. And because you don't take any action, it's okay. If you are going to take action on something that was discussed in executive session, you need to come out of executive session, go back into open session, and somebody makes a motion that the, vote, the board votes on. So all of the decision-making is transparent. So as I said, we have some um, 
modifications, temporary modifications now. One, the designated physical location that has been um, temporarily waived. You need to make sure that the public has a way in. So I think now almost all, not all, but almost all of these um, platforms have a way to call in by phone. So if somebody doesn't have a device or doesn't have internet or whatever, they can still participate in the meeting. Um, and and I, I was impressed with your agenda. You're really clear on how to access the meeting, download the app and all of that. Um, and you must be recording your meetings. Um, that's part of this temporary thing. If it's at all possible, they need to be recorded and those recordings become public. Questions about any of that? Okay. So this is my very favorite expression. A board meeting is a public meeting, but it is not a meeting of the public. What does that mean? It means when you have a lot of people who want to speak at your meeting in your public comments, that's fine. But it is not the place to get into dialogue with, the, with somebody who's not on the board on an issue that they raise that may or may not be on your agenda, that may or may not be a board issue to begin with, that you have not had time to prepare for. It, it's just, it derails the, the public body. It derails the board from conducting the meeting and, and addressing the business that is on the agenda. And that is your job at your board meeting, is to complete your agenda. So you're gonna to listen to what people have to say. It may lead to a future agenda item. It may lead to some other discussion um, at, a, at some other time. It may lead to some public forum, but it's not the time to engage. So if you're expecting a whole lot of people to come out because you're dealing with some contentious issue and, and everybody wants to speak, that's fine. And it's fine to also set up some parameters for that public comment period so you can limit them. Um, and, and you just need to be really clear up front what the, what the rules are. Everybody who's here can speak once, you get two minutes and please refrain from repeating what somebody before you has said or it's gonna be a really long night. And then keep to it. Two minutes. Thank you, next. Thank you, next. Okay. I don't think this board gets into that. So let me ask you this question, and this is a real question. You can think about this and let me know. Are public comments at your meetings a good way to judge the community, how they're feeling on an issue? Anybody? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, generally, no. Because? You oftentimes get the loudest voices. Um, oftentimes you get people who have a particular issue that they're very concerned about, but it might not be representative of what others are feeling. And it's it's a very un, it's a very representative sample. Yeah, it's not scientific representation of your communities, and it's really hard sometimes if you're hearing the same thing over and over and over again to to not walk away and say, well, the community thinks, blah 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 blah, because you've just had an earful of from a few community people who are voicing their opinions, which they're entitled to voice. But that to extrapolate and say, oh, you know, that well, that must mean that's how everybody's thinking is a very, very risky thing to do. Um, it, if you want to take the temperature of your community, have a town hall or send out a survey or, you know, ask the questions. Don't just wait for people who will volunteer to show up and offer their opinion because it, it, you can't count on that being at all representative. Yeah, and one thing I would just kind of suggest as a, a test for that is if you are hearing, like, 
ask your neighbors what they're thinking um, and, and ask you know, people you see and, and seek diverse opinions and see if the voices that are coming across your email and maybe some social media feeds and at the meetings, um, see if those sentiments are reflected in kind of um, the more random samples you might take just out about the town when we can go out about the town again. But um, sometimes that, that's a good, a slightly good um, kind of test of, of whether this is whether there's a broader sentiment you're hearing or um, not. And that's true. You're at least then seeking more input. I will caution, though, that one's sphere of existence may not be yes. um, a really good reflection. And I think that our, our recent political contests are a pretty good demonstration of that. You know, people tend to surround themselves with people who share their thoughts. Yeah, no, that's why I said, you know, try to try to diversify it a little. Don't don't just ask your your peer group, but yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, maybe ask some people that, that you wouldn't that, that you feel a little less comfortable seeking them. If you have that opportunity, that is yeah, sure. Exactly. Sure. Susan, yeah. I have a, a question that maybe does not really have an answer, but just something I'm wrestling with, which is I agree with you that the that public comments at the meeting are not a good way to judge the community's opinion. Certainly, especially if one person shows up meeting after meeting and shares right. the same, you know, same opinion. But I guess the thing that I wrestle with is like it's still worth taking it seriously somehow. And, and that's, I think, definitely, I'm, I'm today is my very first board meeting. So I'm very glad to be- <laughs> Well, welcome. I'm learning so from learning from you tonight. And that's just something that I keep holding is what does the board do about taking someone who cares enough about this to come to us and say, this was really matters to me. How do we take that seriously? And in balance, know also that it's not necessarily the, the, the community's opinions. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, if it's an issue that the board is already grappling with, um, let's say it's, it's a particular element of a budget, okay? I'll give you an example from my own experience. Um, when I served on a school board, we had a couple of board members who decided that we needed artificial turf on our playing fields. And this was a large board. And these couple of people got the parents of all the football players mobilized. And I don't know what it's like in, in, in Montpelier, but I'll tell you the football parents, you don't wanna mess with these people where I live, right? And they got it together and they went off and they decided they were gonna raise half the funds privately and that the board could match it. And they developed this whole plan with one of the school board members ears, okay? And it really complicated things when the board had to really assess the value of the investment, the money of the investment and the timing of it relative to other things that the board prioritized in, in providing for the district to aligned with the vision that we were working towards. Um, and at the end of the day, the board voted against putting that bond out. Um, and it was very, very difficult because those people who were for it were the ones who were showing up to every meeting and they were bringing homemade muffins and they were, you know, they were really going for it. And it, it reminded me um, that it's a challenge. It's a challenge to, to decipher what's going on and who's behind it and how loud are their voices. Um, and so, well, I shouldn't say, so the first time the, we passed it and the bond went out and the bond failed miserably. And so then they wanted to do a revised version and that's when the board said, okay, enough of this. <laughs> this is not the time. Um, so, you know, in that case, the board was swayed by the, what we saw going on in the public, but it was not representative. 
I don't know if that helps you at all. Um, so you have to you have to sort of weigh it against everything else that the board knows that the public doesn't. You know, they can come to every meeting and they can watch everything that they watch, but they're not going to understand the, the texture and the issues that you're grappling with as a board, the way you're going to understand them from the inside. I will say also that over the years, just, um, you know, my son is now in eighth grade, so I've been sort of paying attention to school board matters for that many years. <laughs> um, and, and I think sometimes when you have a small group of people, it can actually be representative of the community values mm -hmm. um, or feelings on an issue. And I understand what you're saying about the statistical significance of having a couple of people arrive to a meeting and talk about something, but that's sort of the same that we've been running into with town meetings and broader um, public meetings that we've been hosting. You know, we're not getting a statistical significant number of people attending those things either. Um, so I think Jim's sort of right. It's like, you do the best you can to, I mean, short of running a statistically significant survey where you're really trying to get a broad understanding of the community's opinion on something. And even then you can't guarantee that everyone's gonna respond to that survey. So, you know, I think as elected officials, we do our best to, like you said on an earlier slide, to um, represent the people in the community. And sometimes if your sphere happens to be reflective of certain values, maybe you're the representative of the board to those people, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you're not, maybe you'll get voted out. <laughs> right. And I, I think that, you know, in, in the best of all possible circumstances, you do have uh, enough representation on the board that you speak with different voices for different opinions in the community. I mean, it's rare that everybody is of like mind on a board, even if every vote ends up being unanimous, if you get to consensus regularly. That doesn't mean that's where you started out. It means that you really deliberated and discussed all parameters, all aspects of an issue before making a, a collaborative decision. And, and I think you do have to trust that you do represent your sphere, you know? Um, I, I, what, as I'm looking around, I will say, and this is, uh, is there anybody serving on this board who does not have children, currently have children in the system? Yeah, there are. Okay, good. Because I think that's a really, really important voice that often is overlooked, especially around budget planning. Um, you know, something crazy like 78% of Vermonters don't have school aged children. Think about that for a minute. And those are the people- Is that because a lot of them are school aged children? I, no, it's because we have an older population. I see. Um, and, but it's been true for a really, really long time. And, but those are the people who are voting on your budgets. So if they don't have kids in the school, they have a different interest in the budget, right? They don't care about whether this particular second grade teacher's contract is getting renewed. They care about our kids are learning there, our schools are on, on the right path to understanding what the future needs will be for these children as they become adults and, and what kind of education they are going to need to help take them there. And doing so in a way that makes me as a taxpayer feel that my money is being well spent. That's a really different approach. And it's really one. So you non parents, it's budget season, speak up, speak up at your budget meetings, you are representing a really important constituency. In that in that instance. Um, I know where I live, when I was on board, we had the equivalent of a town hall. We did it jointly with our select board and we both presented budgets. And then we did it again at town meeting. But one of the things that we didn't do and should have done 
is traveled to, we happen to have a couple of senior residences in my town and we should have gone there and presented there because those are people who can't necessarily get out. Well, nowadays nobody can, but you know, uh, who aren't necessarily mobile or wanting to drive at night or show up to the schools in unfamiliar. And yet these are the people who vote. And so it's really important that you're hearing from them and speaking to them. And so when you, um, you know, when you announce your town halls and when you are looking to get input from people, make sure you go past your community of parents in notifications and that kind of thing. Make sure it's, you know, that you're speaking to everybody because it's really easy to forget that. So email and social media. And I know I'm over time, so you can tell me to stop anytime. Jim, I'm leaving that to you. Let me, let me just query Libby, because I don't want to go much past 8.30. Um, are we expecting the policy readings and policy monitorings to go pretty quickly? We are? OK. Um, we don't have any. Go ahead, Susan. Maybe we'll try to wrap up at 8.15 or so, though. Okay. We don't have anything to say about some of the policies, so we're because we have. That's kind of what that's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a snare I had that I was unaware of. Okay, I'll I'll go really quickly, but still. Well, let me ask it. another question of the board. Does any board member plan to raise any big issues with the policy reading or the policy monitoring? Okay, good. Then why do you take to like eight twenty, Susan? And then we can wrap up. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, and, and I'm going to go fast, but I want your questions are the most important thing. Okay. So let's make sure we have that discussion. And if we don't finish, we don't finish. Um, so we've already addressed a lot of this. The group, group email is OK if you're discussing the agenda or to distribute materials for a meeting, but you may not talk about a meeting. Don't do the following group emails discussing or business or collective editing or participation in a Facebook group or front porch forum by a quorum of the, if, if it's about school business. Well, what does about school business mean? It means anything having to do with the schools because most people don't understand where the board's authority ends and they will always see you as answering for the board. So that one's a tricky one because if there's a community group and six of you wanna be part of it because you're part of the community, that's fine as long as you don't get into the discussions about the schools. So if they're talking about some pocket park that they wanna put on Main Street, that's fine. But if they're talking about um, even something as innocuous as naming your baseball field, stay out of it, which is easy to do. It's a lot harder to do when they're talking about um, something they think you've done wrong, <laughs> right? And they're being really critical. Uh, so this is our world now, right? This is a little out of date here, but this has taken over. We all know that. And we certainly know it in the last eight months, right? Uh, uh, the statistics are crazy. I can't remember exactly what it was about the number of people who rely on Facebook as for uh, their primary source of news, primary. It's frightening. So with all of that and with open meeting law, this is where they co collapse, okay? Um, so be careful of that last one. Don't use social media as a way to talk to each other. That's a really risky thing to do. So here are some guidelines. If you wouldn't want to see what you're saying in print on the newspaper, don't say it in social media or email or blogging or tweeting. Um, executive session, we have already talked about. Really bend over backwards to make sure you're not engaging as a, that a quorum of you is not engaging in something that could be construed as school business. 
make sure you understand your policies around electronic communications. They tend to be less about board communications and more about student and teacher. Um, and this last one, protect your personal email from public records requests by utilizing school district email. So as a public body, you are subject to public records requests. That means anybody in, for no reason at all, can ask to see all your emails. If you're not separating out your personal from your school board work, then you're gonna to have to turn them all over, which is why we strongly advocate for using a school board email address. It means even if you have them all coming into one inbox as I do, it means you can isolate them. And if somebody decides that they, they think that the board has violated open meeting law and that you've been communicating via email about X, Y, or Z, and they wanna see all board emails between any board members from you know, April 12th until June 17th, they're gonna to get to see them all. So if you don't want them knowing what you're doing in your personal life, just keep them separate. It's easy enough to do. All right, so let's go to Facebook, okay? And here's this fictitious community watch group, okay? COVID-19 is out of control. Why is it safe for our kids to be in school when the governor just said everyone who can work remotely should? Schools should be dismissed like they were last spring to ensure the safety of our children, right? This is somebody's post on Facebook. You happen to be a member. Six of you happen to follow this group. Whoop. I just not looking, there we go. So I then am gonna say, well, the whole state's trying to make sure it's safe for kids to be in school. The governor said public school's a need. We can forego the wants like public gatherings so students can go to school and they can be safe. My comment is now a matter of public record. My Facebook post, because remember a meeting doesn't have to have a place, it doesn't have to have a time, it doesn't have a duration, it's always and I'm a school board member. And here's the even worse part. Somebody else chimes in after me, that's public record too. So if three of you are, or four of you are chiming in, be defending the board's actions, right? Because there's legitimacy to defending them and it's so tempting you're in trouble with your open meeting law and your public records. So best practice, stay out of it. If you need to follow it to see what people are saying, fine, but don't participate. And again, if one person is gonna be the board spokesperson, then that's the one person who should be participating or delegating. In this case, if it, you know, Jim, if you're not a social media person and somebody else is, and you feel that that can be delegated, that's fine. But you are not able to take off your school board hat on Facebook. So you're always a school board member. Now, if you're acting as your own self among your friends and venting, I mean, I would say that's probably not a great vehicle for it anyway but you know you're having a frustration with your kids schooling and you want to vent about it find another way to do it just save yourself the the angst of it okay and this is an important piece down at the bottom there if there's a quorum of you on this group whether you're all physically online at the same time or not and you end up getting involved in school business, it's an unwarned meeting. Major red flag with open meeting law. And I'm gonna ask you this question too. Is this a good way to judge community's opinions? Facebook or Twitter? 
in the interest of time, I will say, no, it's a bad way. God, I hope not. Right. I mean, first of all, people feel unfiltered, right? They can say anything. We've seen that repeatedly. Um, and second of all, just like the loud people who show up at your meeting, you're going to have the loud people on Facebook, right? Um, so don't use that as a, a representation of what your community is thinking, because they're getting, it's the angry people who are getting riled up if there's something they don't like. So be really, really careful about it. And I will tell you, honestly, in the last year, I personally know of two instances of school officials, one an employee and one a board member who violated this, who used Facebook inappropriately. Wasn't there a principal who mm -hmm. got, yeah. The principal was fired and a board member has been censured and they're trying to figure out how to get them off the board, which you really, that's a whole other story. We won't go there. Um, so I do have a specific question about mm -hmm. this. Um, I, so again, back to this budget town hall, mm -hmm. you know, we had, we, we warned it, the, yep. the, the district warned the town hall and I posted the warning. There is a Facebook page, as you probably know, that is friends of Montpelier Roxbury public schools. I simply posted the warning as a way of putting the warning further out there. Did I, did I just break open meeting? No, because you didn't offer any. You, you yeah. merely presented information. Correct. Yeah. I did not offer my opinion. I just right. said, this is happening. Please join us. Okay. Right. You, you didn't engage in a discussion on anything. You yeah. just right. provided fact. Okay. Yeah, and the same is true with email. If, if, if uh, you know, there's a, a group email on what time's the meeting, that's fine. Or, or something logistic. Like when we meet in person again, we have meetings in Roxbury. So you could... You could ask, you know, can we carpool uh -huh. um, and coordinate a carpool there? But then do not talk about board business in the carpool because that would be an unwarned meeting. But you can you can coordinate logistics and share information. Right. And I, I'll tell you, in some particularly the smaller rural towns around the state where they tend to have small boards, if they've got a five person board and three of them go out to lunch together, they're hosed. Because that's a quorum, even if they're best friends and they've known each other their whole lives, and you know it, it, they have to be careful. You now you guys aren't confronted with that. A, you're a bigger board, and B, it's not likely that you're all in the same social group. But you know uh, these things are awkward at best. Okay, so I've covered off a lot. Um, and try to keep it all through that lens of what, what's it okay to say and what's it not okay to say. Did I leave out any scenarios that you guys wanna talk about? I have a question. Um, yeah. So I'm also new to the board. And, um, Excellent, love new and board it, member. <laughs> we've talked quite a bit about open meeting law, so I'm you know, pretty familiar with it, I've done reading. Um, I'm just wondering, so, in terms of you are allowed to talk to each other outside of meetings one on one but not about, about board business but not about board business right so you're never allowed to have a conversation about anything happening with the schools with another board member even if it's just one other person best practice would be not to so even even if it's not a quorum you just have two board members who want to discuss something best practice is not to this. It's, you know, it's, to me, it's a gray area. It's true. If you don't have a quorum, officially it's okay, but then you get into the situation and I've, I've seen it happen where one board member has an agenda on a particular item. And so they go and they talk to each of the other board members individually. And then they come back and they say at the meeting, well, I talked to everybody and everybody said, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden you've got um, people in town who are raising open meeting violation questions. Even though nobody actually violated it, it 
gives the appearance of doing board work outside of an open meeting. So I'm a little confused as how that relates to earlier we were talking about editing a document and it was suggested, I forget if it was from you, um, that perhaps one board member be in charge of writing the document and then surveying other board members to get input on the document. So if we were rewriting a policy, if one person were the person to draft the policy, I might reach out to the other members to get input, but that's- well, they're at the meeting. At the meeting only. Right. Not outside of the meeting. Right. So there have been a couple of times where I've reached out as a new board member being confused about stuff or wanting to clarify things, reached out to Jim. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? So yeah. you can only talk to Jim outside of board meetings about well, school so issues. So you were, if you were asking for background on an issue that was in front of the board or detail about the budget process, you know, it, it, if you were not deliberating an issue, a current issue that the board is confronting, then you're, you know, it, it, that would be training really, right? I mean, you're, you're learning what you need to know to be doing your job. Um, so that's different than deliberating on an issue. So I think what I hear you saying is that it's technically allowed to talk to other board members individually about board business, but that it's, it, it can be a slippery slope. Exactly. Yes. Yes, and, and certainly if you were to then show up at a board meeting and say, well, I think this has been decided because one of the things that is defined an open meeting is that decisions are made by the board. So clearly if like Jim and I were to have a conversation about busing, Jim and I cannot make the decision for the board about busing. And so no. I can't show, that, show up at the board and be like, well, Jim and I talked about this. So clearly the, it's done. Right, but if you individually also then talk to Jill and Ma Mara and Andrew and Emma separately, one-on-one, -on -one, and then sit down at the meeting and say, well, I've already talked to the majority of board members and they agree with me that this is what we need to do. Yeah. That's where you get into the slip. Right, that, that definitely seems yeah. problematic. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Even if it's not technically problematic, it has... It has the appearance of being problematic. Well, it has the appearance of, of having that discussion privately, which in fact is what you did when it should be an open discussion. And but it, you are allowed to talk to your neighbors or friends about board business yeah. one on one. Right, because you're informing them typically of what the board is grappling with or some or gathering information or gathering yes. information right so this is Anikit. um just so i guess to play devil's advocate am i hearing that it's um in the strictest sense um it's okay to talk to the other board members and have you know exchange um information one-on-one -on -one and come back and <laughs> say not give the appearance, again, I'm playing devil's advocate, in the board meeting that we've talked, but at the same time, you have exchanged ideas and you know, you've know you talked about it with one-on-one -on -one with four different members. And then come decision time, you will, you know, it, it's an open um, setting where you're making that de decision uh, and you probably are having discussion and whatnot, but there is some discussion or some interchange of ideas that's happened outside and that technically is okay? Well, that's really the part you want to avoid is when there's energy for it outside. Um, and, and the idea that you talked individually with people, but collectively it was a majority of you. I'm not an attorney and I don't want to guess which side of right and wrong that comes down to, but the spirit of the law would suggest that that's not a good idea. 
it, right? Susan, Susan, I just realized on this, um, touching on exactly what you're talking about, um, the Secretary of State has a little guidance on it that they put under the term, which is a really good term. They've clearly thought a lot about this, serial communications. Perfect. And what they say is, do, are you all right with me reading this? Thank yeah. you, yeah. Let's, yeah let's, let's make this point and, and wrap up. Yeah. It says, the open meeting law does not explicitly address serial communications, also known as serial meetings, walking quorums, or daisy chain communications. We generally recommend that board members avoid engaging in successive interrelated private conversations about the board's business that taken together involve a quorum. And um, it goes on to say that because the law seems to allow for gathering over time, these types of communications can be risky um, if used to develop consensus. And I think the whole thing there that they really emphasize is that when you when they're successive and they're interrelated, they form they, they can potentially form a quorum. So what they seem to be saying, they say we of course we understand that individual board members and administrators need to work between meetings. So and and to educate themselves on matters under their jurisdiction. And they're not raising an issue about that. What where the Secretary of State is drawing the line is with the serial communications that involve a quorum. They say that's where it gets questionable as yeah. to whether there could be a public meeting violation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that really just corroborates what we've just been talking about. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. That's a great resource. Um, so I, I do want to wrap up. If you have lingering thoughts or questions, I am always available to you. You guys, you know, your dues to VSBA pays my salary, so <laughs> I'm yours. Um, oops, that's me. That's how you can reach me. That is my cell phone number at home, which is where I'm working. Um, and I, Hope that you all know how to reach us at VSBA. Um, and for those of you who are very new, I really encourage you um, in your spare time to spend a little bit of time on our website. There's all kinds of great resources there that might help you um, become more comfortable with this unusual role that a school board plays in, in the district, in the community um, and in the law. You know, for those of us who aren't legal experts, it's, it's something new to understand. Um, so I leave you with that. I owe you an answer to one question, which I will get out to Jim in the morning. I thank you very much for your time. And please, any of you, don't ever hesitate to reach, you know, reach out to me. Um, and <clears throat> especially for some of you who are newer, but for all of you, we do do a monthly webinar on a different topic every month. And I, if, if you haven't had the chance, um, we do them from 12 to one on the first Thursday of every month. Um, we, you should all be getting emails from us. If you're not, please let me know. We may not have the right email address. Um, and and our, as I said in the beginning, one of our biggest missions is to help boards do their work. So if you're a new member and you're feeling a little at sea, let us know, we'll help you out. Thank you very much for your time tonight. I hope you get through the rest of your agenda. I'm out of here. Thank Great. you. Thank so you, Susan, we really appreciate it. And we Thank definitely will have you back. Thanks, Susan. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. Um, Jim, uh, what is the process to follow to request one of the, um, one of the books that Susan referenced? Yeah, I'd like one too. We can get it for you. Who are, yeah. tell me another. There's Mia. Mia and Jill requesting them. Anyone yeah. else? We'll get a few. I have I think I have some on my bookshelf. So we'll get a few in stock and uh, get it out to you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, third reading of the electronic communication between employees and students policy and the C12 prevention of surrection sexual harassment is prohibited by Title IX. Um, any comments or edits to those? No? Great. Um, read thirdly. Um, and uh, policy monitoring, um, expectations of MRPS board members, uh, which arrived a little late, courtesy of
my oversight. Um, uh, the G14 class size policy, and then the um, F12 diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Any comments on those before uh, entertain a motion to approve them? I have, I have one quick comment on the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy. Um, Libby, you mentioned that right now there's a freeze on data coming from the state. Um, I'm just wondering, can you briefly expound upon that? That caught my attention. Well, we never got the youth risk behavior survey for our schools. We've gotten them for um, the county and the, or the district. We just haven't gotten it for the school broken up by schools. And they wrote an email to us today saying they were going to delay the youth risk, the YRB survey for this year until the spring. And we were like, well, we never got the data for last year. So that's fine by us to delay it. Um, so, and then last year we didn't have aspect, we never took aspect or next gen. So we don't have up-to-date state standardized testing. Um, and quite honestly, in the spring last year, we wouldn't have the best data to share with the board. So typically by this time in the school year, I would have shared academic data with you all, um, as well as academic goals. We're in a different, the, the place that we're in right now in regards to our data collection and our knowledge of what data is, is a very uncomfortable place for me right now because we just don't have good data at the moment because of what happened in the spring and because of where we are now, although we're, we're getting it now, we're getting our feet underneath us right now. So fingers crossed we can stay in school so we can continue that, that process. So it's totally on me and the principals. We're just putting more things on our, on our teachers. Um, it's a bit hard. We are having day to days starting in December with each of our buildings. So hopefully we'll be able to get a clearer picture, but we're not in the same place we usually are with goal development, goal attainment. We're just not in the same place where we usually are. Um, Any other comments? I, I just have a couple of questions. What does SBEC stand for? Uh, SBEC Martyr is Balanced Assessment Consortium. Oh, look at Jill. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Jill. It's the standardized test that we have to take in Vermont. Got that, it. That assesses the common core state standards. Got it. And just a clarification on the class size stuff. Um, I saw that the kindergarten through really like second grade are pretty small. And I just couldn't tell, is that, is, do we know if COVID is in, impacting that? Like, is it there are, five classrooms in the building and then there's one more and there so we're actually spread out over six classrooms or is it five classrooms total just as like a hypothetical example the only one that we know for sure that COVID has influenced or no I shouldn't say that that we highly believe that COVID has influenced is our kindergarten numbers because kindergarten kindergarten isn't a mandatory grade level in Vermont so parents may have just not registered their kids um, which is completely within their purview to do um, and so our kindergarten numbers are considerably lower this year than they have been in the past. And we're not sure why, because they would never, we wouldn't have had access to those parents beforehand unless they were in our pre-K. So the other gotcha. numbers are pretty good. The other numbers are inclusive of the virtual and in-person, you know, and, and we could get the home study numbers, but it wouldn't influence it that much. Right. And so I think in like, there's maybe five first grade classrooms. If you're saying there's five first grade classrooms and you say that's inclusive of virtual, that means there's maybe four in the building and one class is virtual. I'm counting my first grade teachers in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, I was just picking first grade as like not to be specific, but. Yeah, so our classroom size right now for first grade across with our classrooms the way they are are, are about 13 in a class 12 yeah. Different okay class. yeah i think i caught just a minor um typo on the class size report as well um for grade three at ues you're showing optimal class size as 17 but in the policy it states that three and four are at an optimal average per grade cluster at 22. I'd have to look more closely at it. I don't have it pulled up. 
right here. I was going off of Grant. Grant puts an enrollment chart together and I was going off of that. So it may just be a little bit different language. I know it was changed fairly recently. Um, the optimal class size in the policy was changed fairly recently, but I think it used to be K through three and now it's K through two and then three and four are separated out. I'll have to look, I'm not sure. And I, and I do want to say the DEI policy, I said we're in non-compliance because it's a huge policy um, and we're just not there yet. And so when I say we're in non-compliance, it's not in a, on a shame, shame on us kind of way. We're working really hard on that. Just we're not there yet. And I don't, I honestly don't know if we'll ever be there. Yeah, <laughs> no, New York, or should we be, right? We're always working on that one. Um, so that's a different type of policy. Um, so I, I wanted the board just to make sure we heard that. Hey, Libby, real quick, I don't remember in the original discussions about the class size policy preschool numbers um, coming up into the discussion. It's not in our class size policy. But should it be? Would it help in terms of number of teachers or number of rooms to have a defining number for the preschool class as well? I'm not sure if it should be because it's, it's, the preschool has so many different laws to it than K through than starting in kindergarten on up. It's like, cause it's, it, it works with both human services and the agency of education at the state level. And so those two things have a lot of different rules. Um, they, so the preschool class, class size may be mandated by other rules. Sure. So a policy may not be necessary. Yeah, like I said, I don't remember, but it was when you had started making a comment about COVID having the biggest impact on something the first thing that jumped into my mind was the preschool numbers because parents just chose not to send their kids, but preschool wasn't in there. And I just couldn't remember why preschool wasn't included. Yeah, that's just, I, I my bet would be that it's in the law. It's only so many we kids. Have have, we have like so many feet to a bathroom in a law. I would imagine that class size is also there. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. But you're also right, Ryan, in that, especially at Roxbury, our pre-K numbers were drastically influenced by COVID this year. Um, and a bit at, at UES as well. We have a, we, it was the first year that we didn't have a wait list at UES, I think. Yeah, it's one more year, right? <laughs> yeah. Other questions or motion to approve the, um, the reports? I move to approve the policy monitoring reports for policies A A03, G14, and F22. Uh, a second? I'll second. Uh, Anakit? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mia? Aye. Mara? Aye. Emma? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Great. Um, Motion to adjourn. Mara, do you want to make it since this is? I move um, we adjourn this meeting. <laughs> have a second. I have one little thing. Yes. Um, you had mentioned finding a, a mentor for me. And oh, I was yeah. just going to say, maybe in the interest of both time and not putting anybody on the spot, maybe we could just say, if they're interested in doing that, which I would love to have one, they email you and then you pair us up. And Perfect. if there's more and than one, they can thumb wrestle for it or something. I don't know. <laughs> I have also never heard of this mentor idea and have not been appointed a mentor. No. And we might need a third. Now we might need a third. No, so no. anyway, this seems like a good thing to just handle over email. Maybe. Ryan, okay. Jim, and Andrew, you're up. <laughs> it's yeah. a logistical thing. Know. It's a logistical thing. It seems like we wouldn't be breaking up and meeting loss. Our board well, I'm our happy to do policy that we have just approved our compliance with indicates that we're supposed to have mentors. Yes. Um, Who's my yeah, mentor? Yeah, that's it. I'm happy that. to be. I'm happy to be a, a mentor to either, either, either of you. So, um, Jim, aren't you my mentor? I think I'm your mentor as well. <laughs> He's doing an excellent job too. <laughs> yeah. we, we talked a couple times. Um, <laughs> no, I've yeah, found some questions off. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so let's do that by email. Uh, do you have a second on the, the motion to adjourn? I'll second that. Um, Anakit? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Jill? Aye. Mia? Aye. Mara? Aye. Emma? Aye. And Andrew? Aye. Thanks, everyone. Um, we'll see you again in Zoom world. Sounds Thanks. great. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye. Mara. Take care, Mara. Best, best. Thank you, Mara. Mara. You're the best. Thank you. So Thank much. you. You have not heard Bye. the best of me. Yes. <laughs> Hope you sprung our bus with love. <laughs>